Hi everyone and welcome back to another episode of Total Sports Podcast. My name is Sydney and I'm alongside Caleb and Hi. Danik and today we have a special guest with us. So today we are joined by an ex-national 100 meter and 200 meter sprint athlete who now takes her knowledge and experience in the coaching group. She's now a strength and conditioning coach with a wealthy catalog of top local athletes. She has worked with ranging from world record holder Nicholas Paul, Quasi Brown, Dylan Carter, Michelle Yayi, Ryan Sibyl, you name it, she's worked with them. So we have Antonia Buta. How are you? I'm good. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, you know, you're coming from far today. Thank mm. you for joining us. And we can also add to her introduction that you coach with UTT. And we have... Captain. Yes, we have total sports variant Kina, Alexander, and Tyler Austin on your team. <laughs> so shout out to Kina and Tyler. You also earned your certification in top strength and conditioning from the Top Strength and Conditioning Association in the world, as well as an ISSA certification. Notably, you work with the 4x400 silver medal winning team in Drift at Yeah. Yes. And you also serve as the strength and conditioning coach for the Guyana Amazon. Women, see? Yeah. The CPR. Mm-hmm. So tell us where did it all begin? Um, the coaching or just in general? Yeah. I can tell the story. I'm <laughs> um, Okay, so when I was younger, um, I got into track and field at around the age 12. Um, and to be fair, I didn't like it because I wasn't really good at it. Like, I felt I was good at it in primary school, but on the national level, I wasn't um, where I thought I needed to be. And my mother was kind of like, no, you're going to stick at it. And she's the one who made me stay at it. My grandfather was the one who was feeling sorry for me. I'm like, stop forcing me to do something she don't want to do. Um, but my mother kind of like stuck at it. And my breakthrough came like at around age 16, 17. Mm-hmm. Um, that's when I made my first national team, CAC Juniors, and then I made Crifters and all that for four by ones. Um, Kelly and Batiste, Wanda Hudson, Seymour Hackett, Molly Cabral. Um, so that was my breakthrough, got a, a track scholarship to University of South Alabama. Um, after my track career, I didn't want to see a track, to be honest. I stayed with one track for like four years, and then I'd be around 26-ish, 27. Mm-hmm. Um, I always had a, a, an affinity to like helping youths. Right. So I kind of like went back to my old track club, Memphis, and I was just looking on, and then I offered to help. Mm-hmm. And from there, the coaching journey started. Um, I quit my full-time job, I still got in life. I quit it um, on all years day because I cannot enter in 2012 <laughs> for this job. So that was there. That's pretty good. 11, 2012, um, I started coaching full time. I was coaching from before. I lied. I lied. I started coaching in 2012, and in 2014 is when I quit like proper. Right, right. So I didn't enter 2015 um, with the job. So 2015, January, I was like solely coaching. and. Um, that was just me try, trying my hand on something. Like, I was not making any money really between January and uh, September because I also tore my list rank ligament. Mm-hmm. Um, so I couldn't walk and all that. So then, September is when I started MP High Performance Training as my strength and conditioning um, business, which gym is in Woodbrook. Um, so I started that and then I went 2015. I can't believe it, but after that, September, the following July, um, I went to a sport company um, to work with the National Gym, and that's where I met all the athletes or whatever. And 2017 is when I got the position of like lead, um, and that's when I started working with the cyclists, and it was just me alone to the cyclists, and all the names you just called. And yeah, so I'm going to track and feel those in between all that as well. I also understand that you were in an accident. Can you share with us your emotion through that time and not being able to compete again? Yeah, I didn't bring that up. You didn't have to tell any story. But anyway, so um, in college, it was during one of my summer breaks. I went to Florida um, with our family there. And my uncle was driving and he was speeding. Um, the car, it was a one car accident, it was literally just us. So the car spun on some gravel and flipped and hit a light pole, like, or fall out of the car. He was ejected, I got pinned in the car. So after that, um, my entire right side, I had no use of it. So that's, that's why my track career ended, to be fair. 
Um, and for months, I couldn't walk, I couldn't use my right hand. Um, my mother was like, bring my child home. Uh, so I came home, still didn't have use of my right side, really. Um, and then eventually, I, I'm not a big person of faith because of what I went through. Right. Um, I do think, like, you know, my faith and God is what helped me to really get back use of my get, right side. Get through that time. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, so all of us I didn't see a trap as well, so they kind of like ended up roughly. So I did finish my college education down here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that was the whole accident situation. So, like, for people who may be watching, right, because there are a lot of athletes that, you know, they experience a lot of moments like that in their life, and they might consider it, like, end, the end of everything. But for you, it wasn't the end. It was a beginning. Like, what would you tell an athlete like that? A former athlete just there, they just there, they feel like they're down and out. What What would you tell them to inspire them, to help yeah, them? Yeah, I would... Um... I'm not gonna like sugarcoat it. Like you have to feel emotions and go through emotions. Yeah. Um, it didn't. It, it wasn't like quick like that because I was in my accident in July, um, and I didn't start by getting me some mileage until until like October, or like, November. Yeah. Um, and I don't think I was ever depressed to be honest. Um, I think I was kind of like just grateful to be alive. Um, because the accident was bad. Like they had to airlift me to the hospital because they, they drove up with a minute. Mm-hmm. So um, it was just a matter of just being grateful to be alive, but. In terms of athletes with season ending or career ending injuries, I would definitely say like um, it's not the end all and the all because again I'm big on faith and if it was meant to be, to, it would be. Mm-hmm. But I would say you know go through the emotions, feel what you need to feel, but then on the other side of it, try to find purpose in what happened. Um, and I'm very big as well on education, so I always tell people track and field is not or any sport is not the is not going to be around when you're 50 and 60 or 40. Like, you need to get your education because at any moment, they could be going like that. Yeah. So that's kind of like my message to the athletes all the time. Like, I'm huge on education. Even my junior athletes in Memphis, like, uh, from Form 3, we sit them down and tell them, these are the subjects you need if you want to get a scholarship. Um, and we kind of, like, press on them to make sure they do what they need to do um, in the classroom. And well, I'm UTT school, so that's big as well. And you call it side as well. Um, let's say that's there's an athlete coming to you for your services. What does what is it what is going through your mind as you take them on their wing to have them training for a common tournament or something like that? Well, I guess you have to kind of be more specific because which service? So like I have MPHPT, I have right, so Memphis, I have UTT. Is a tra- let's say it's a track athlete and he's performing, he's getting ready for a competition, let's say uh, 100 meters. Um, what... What um what is he what are you looking at what are you looking at him towards um getting ready for him for that competition or for that certain discipline of track? Yeah, like what are the what are the aspects you look for the require with regards to high performance yeah. that you would assess him based on to you know like hey well you need X, Y, and Z. Like is there a criteria or Okay, so I guess the first thing to kinda of like clarify just to make sure is you also you know you actually come to me? Yeah. Or- yeah. Okay. Yeah, is the so hypothetical. Not, I'm not a I'm asking. That is the hypothetical. No? If okay. a athlete, uh, so any athlete, yeah, if a athlete, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um. So if it's a sprinter, I would definitely say like, um, one of the things you can't really train. Um, I don't want to say train, but it's speed and um, leg like turnover. Mm-hmm. You can train it, of course, but um, there's a saying, and I don't want to say it like, if you get a mule. You can't turn a mule into a stallion, right? You can just mm. make them a very good mule. Yeah. So there are certain um, characteristics in a in an athlete that you look for for a sprinter. Um, that fascist muscle. Um, some people are genetically born with more than others, right. and you see it when you just have the athlete just run, right? You see the mm. Um So there's one guy in UTT right now who did not fit the bill for the requirements to get in, but he never ran track before. Um, but he came and said he wanted to join the team or whatever. But when I did the assessment, like, he literally, like, high knees, like, three matches, and then his turnovers are, like, real quick. But when I say he never run track before, like, you can tell it's raw. Yeah. But somebody like that, um, you could work with that. Because then all you have to teach is proper technique. You have to just teach proper ma- mechanics. But right. that turnover on leg speed is something that they can't really, like, train. You can train it, as I say, but it has some people who just have it. That is interesting. Because- like, mm-hmm. I think about it now because sometimes, like me personally, people t- ask me why I don't run. 
And you were saying here that, well, you know, you had to be born for it, you have certain genes for it. Um, my brother, he's also a runner. He runs for New Jet. So it's very interesting to hear that from you. And well, you spoke about education and that aspect of things. Do at Memphis, right? Because you're at Memphis. What do you have an education program? Because like for younger athletes looking at it, what are the kind of material they need to go through to learn to improve the game and to improve their standings as athletes to be competitive? Well, we don't make them sit down and like, read anything on track and field. Oh. Um, we encourage them to like go on YouTube and look at what athletes do okay. who are the top of the game now. Okay. Um, and then, well, the coaches have to be educated. Right. So, Dr. Hitler is a doctor. Right. So, in the science, in the body and stuff, like here and all that. Um, I have level three, I have level three. So it's a matter of like that burden in the athletes so too much. Like they don't need to be reading no book and learning to certify themselves right now. It's just about um, we bring in the information, we apply the science to the programs, and then we just encourage them to go online and see what your, your top athlete, your favorite top athlete doing, you know, yeah. in terms of mentality, training, regime, technique, coming on the blocks. Uh, but the 800 person come in, the first 400, you know. So, so like you're that. more like a, to guide them in the right direction, kind of mm-hmm. educating them. Okay, mm-hmm. I understand. Uh, as a coach, can you share with us how you spend your day, take us through your routines that help you achieve your progress? You need another hour for my, for my day. <laughs> so my day literally starts at 7 a.m. Um, now, if I go like right now, um, so I'm going to have UTT at 7. Then Michelle will come at 8. Um, Michelle is a pro, so... It is literally her job, so she's not gonna finish training until like all the days she has gym when you go to the gym like twelve. Um, then from there, I eat lunch from two o'clock. My private clients, so MP, starts, um, and then Memphis is at four. On certain days, I have private clients in the gym, um, so that finishes like around eight. So my day goes from like seven to eight on some days. Yeah. And who is your most interesting athlete to work with and why? Mm, interesting how? Because it have, each person different, you know. Um, track and field wise, uh, that be hard. I'm going to do strength conditioning. Strength conditioning, um, it's just different. Like, just saying Philip is or was because he retired. Um, I think one of the most interesting in terms of uh, his just raw talent. So he would come to the gym at 6 a.m., only drinking a cup of coffee. But once he reached the gym, it's like one time, you know. And then, of course, he doing crazy things in the gym. Mm. Um, Nicholas Paul is just like, again, raw talent. Interesting in terms of um, he's somebody, like he knows exactly how much grams of protein he needs a day. So he buys meat. Like when we went to Europe, he bought like, the exact amount of meat he would need in order to perform and in order to cover and stuff properly. Um, track and field wise, most interesting. It's just so much other than Keon Benjamin. is Keon Benjamin. Like, I can't even. He has to say it's like interesting in different ways. Each person has a little, you know, thing. It doesn't matter. I was just hoping somebody the other day, like, within each athlete. And have it to tweak and know how to do them in the video. But yeah. You will you will you are working with uh, Michelle Yeah you now and I also saw on your Instagram actually you're also working with the likes of Crystal Emmanuel as well. She's from um, Canada. How did they come into your services? Were you training with them from before? Is this recent? Um, nah, so that's recent. So um Crystal and Michelle are friends and uh, um well, Crystal is in Canada, national record, we have the And Michelle right now is at home for a period until she goes onto the circuit. So Michelle has a coach in LA, but of course, he's not here. So she asked me to kind of like step in. Mm. Um, and me and her coach will work together um, in terms of the program and stuff. Um, and then through that, because Crystal was also in Michelle's camp in, in California. So through that, Crystal came and was like, yeah, well, I'm just falling as well. I, like, listen, it literally was like, hey, Crystal, wanna come? All right, cool. So it was like, I cannot say how it came about in that regard. 
Um, but it happened. So, yeah. And what's it like training with two accomplished athletes like them? Like you said, two hundred meter record holder and Michelle Yai, she won. If I remember correctly, it was twenty sixteen where she won the Commonwealth gold. gold. Yeah. Um. To be honest, it's easy and hard. It's hard in the sense that um, because they have a lot to accomplish. Um, I put pressure on myself to make sure that they, they get where they need to be. Um, I also don't have a day off in terms of, I, if I, will, I, I wake up and there's nothing to do to get up at 7 o'clock, Michelle and them don't want to get up, basically. Like, mm-hmm. They have something to do, you know. So, But then it's also easy because once we start to work, we start to work. And it's not a matter of having to peg them to do what they need to do. Or mm-hmm. like the intrinsic motivation that they possess. Right. makes my job much easier. Like, I don't have to be like, don't forget to have world champs in August. Like, they know that. So it's not something I have to pull out to them. Like, once they hit the gym or once they hit the track, the will gets done. Um, and yeah, it's easy enough to do. And well, you start, you started this business, you see, um, leaping out and it was like, oh, you're not going to, you, you left your job and it was like, I'm not going to go the new year with the job. And jumping out, you see, then I started me to make money and stuff. So how was, as a business owner and a small business owner at that time, what was the process like? How was, like, your mental? How was the experience, like, from there, started with nobody and building to who, what you are now and all the people that you work with? Um, mentally, is it? Yeah, mentally. Because um... the reason why I ask is because sports and business, you know, is... Uh, it's not always very mixed in Trinidad. Mm-hmm. You don't really find the interlap often, but you made it happen. So I just ask it for people who may be looking, you know, I might want to start a sports business. Somebody there might want to start a sports business. Like me. Like mm-hmm. Yannick, yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah. So like, what was it like for you mentally to, you know, to keep going on until you find that breakthrough? Yeah, so to be very honest, like, I tell people don't do what I do like it's not I honestly don't know why I made it and I'm not even trying to be like I honestly do not know how I made sport a career because it's not something that's done in Trinidad um so that period when I made the decision I was literally on face and then my best friend crying I was like I don't want to go to work tomorrow and she's like any job that'll have you crying like you shouldn't be going to work mm. um and then I got and I was horrible like I just didn't want to be there and I was still living home at the time, and I was going to tell my mom, my mom, my mom was like, when I leave, she's like, you're living home, you have support. So that literally, that happened, that support, first of all, was important. A mm-hmm. um, couple of months, between January and August, like I said, didn't really take it on. Like, I, I went to my USATF certification in July, do even know how I get I honestly don't know how I did other things there, because I literally put had no money, but whatever. So I went July to my certification, August, um, came home September I I got connected to somebody who wanted to do some to train so that was the start of it mm-hmm. and it just kind of like spiraled from there and to be honest I don't know if there was ever a period so being broke affects me very bad like I get depressed I do not like I put that on Twitter the other day when somebody so, somebody asked what motivates you or what what puts you in a positive space and I put money so like <laughs> when I am broke I'm very depressed I remember there was a short period where I was like oh my gosh like I have no money and it wasn't even not having money it's probably like a three thousand and one four thousand from clients right mm. but I already got into the grand scheme of things um and I honestly don't know how or when it happened but it literally just started like snowballing. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of my clients are like mood amount and references. So yeah. um, and I, I guess it comes down to also doing good work. Like I I pride myself on being very thorough, um, being very disciplined. So like I invested in myself. The CSCS that I did at the CSC number one in the world that was like twenty thousand dollars. But it's something I have to do, right? Um, so I do pride myself in that. Um, and then I got the breakthrough sport company. So like I will say what I was able to accomplish, I will not tell people to do what I did. Like I would if I tell anybody like stay in your job and then figure out a way to do it on the side. Like don't just quit your job. I was mad um, and it worked out. But I also 
while having NP on the side, I was also working sport company. Right. So like sport company was from 5 a.m. to 1 p.m. And then I would go to the gym, right. my gym. And then, you know, work from there and then Memphis at 4. So it was like definitely a grind. Um, and I don't think I ever had time to think too much on how much I'm not looking out. Because I was up at 4 to go to work to 5. Right. And the cyclists at that time would use the gym in Central. So like I used to drive to Chironos, drive back to Port of Spain to work with like, um, you know, like I got a Dion Lendo came to the gym a couple of times, resting these kind of things. So I don't know, I, I honestly think mentally I didn't have the time to be like, oh, poor me. Right. You know, so I probably not the right person to ask that question to. Um, but yeah, yeah. I honestly, honestly to this day I always ask I always ask myself like how did I make it? No, this? but you saying that and from what I'm gathering from you is about putting yourself out there being at the right place at the right time and investing in yourself, which is very important because, as you say, it's word of mouth, which means that your work spoke for you before you even entered the room. And while we're on that, you also work with the Amazon Warriors woman. So, like, how was that experience? How did that experience come about? Uh, like, how? Um, so, the, for, first of all, I do want to say, like, there, there have been people in my life that um, put me in position in the position I'm in, right? So, yeah. like my mentor, Doctor Hippolyte, who was the coach for Jamie Gordon, mm-hmm. like he kind of like pushed me to start MPHPT, um, and then the sport company to buy us up. He was there now. He gave me the shot. So I would say like there will have been people, you know, along the way. The guy on Amazon Warriors, um, cricket was never in my like eye shot. Mm-hmm. Just because West Indies and cricket is something that's very, I don't want to say cliquish, but I want to say in cricket, in cricket. Right. Um, so I kind of like never thought of it. Um, and it was last year when we just landed from Carista in Jamaica, like literally in the airport. I got the call and was like, we bring in the women's series on. Um, and we wanted to work with, with the interest of South April last year. And I was like, yeah. But of course it's April. And of course when June, July, I'm like, oh my gosh, what did I sign up for? Um, because I was terrified, honestly, I was really terrified. Um, he's following me on Twitter, I'm sure he probably see all my tweets saying I'm extremely scared. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that was literally, again, um, the head of the sports science in West Indies, I guess, would have heard up, heard up about me and I hope or whatever, and kind of reached out and, yes, yeah, so I hope you come back this year. I hope you come back this year. No, you hope you come back this year. No, you hope you come back this year. <laughs> Put it all over in the corner. Yeah, so um, yeah, that's how that came about. And then later on in the years, when I heard that I was assigned to Diana Amazon Warriors, so yeah. How was it working with the players and whatnot? Like, what was like the personalities down there? Um, just nah, like, I really enjoyed them. Like, to this day, something else, I feel like I've missed them a little bit. <laughs> and I still talk to all of them, so like, I still talk to Stefan Taylor. Um, Cherry and Fraser, I talked to, to all of them. Shamilia Cornell was just in Trinidad. She came to train with me in December and then she came back in March. So she was here, yeah, Alan was here, I was on the Barbados team. But yeah, so the players and I have a really good relationship up to this day. Um, Krishma Ramara and I went to coffee two weeks ago. She's like, I don't know coffee now. So I'm still really good with all of them. Mm-hmm. I really enjoyed them. Um, and the period of time I had them, they would have. So, and that's what I asked for, you know. I would just want to get a little bit on your technical side now. So, can you take us through what would be. Uh, I saw you working on it um, sometime before, like different periodization plans. What, you like. Be on my Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm on Instagram. I, I am on. I am <laughs> a former UTT student with specializations in exercise. Well, how are you seeing you work on it? I put, I put that on my Instagram story. What does it? What are you going through when you do it? When you do these different plans, and obviously it depends on the athlete that you're working with. So what really, what really goes on when you when you do those periodization plans? Yeah, so it's not about cycles of macro, meso, and micro. Um, and once you understand what the end goal is, so track and field is probably the easiest mm. because track and field has like set seasons. Um, cricket does not cycle indefinitely. Cycling definitely does not. Um, a lot of sports don't. Um, so for track and field wise, like as a track coach, you know that senior, it was a senior athlete, 
they need to pick for senior champs in order to qualify for Olympics or world champs. And then they need to pick again for world champs and Olympics. So you yeah, do the, the plan that way and you work backwards. Um, and then for juniors, you know, they need to pick for Crypto trials because they need to make the team. And then they have to hold the peak because you, know, you have to be able to train and to hold the peak until mm-hmm. Crypto. Um, and then they need to pick a game for junior champs and then pick a game for whatever national team, if they make any, right? And the one understand how to how to um, plan for multiple peaks in a season um, or how to hold a peak um, and yeah so I guess it's that and then for strength training it's a lot more difficult to be very fair in Trinidad um, to plan period like periodization plans because coaches in Trinidad will communicate and that's one thing I will complain about so yeah. If I am coaching a footballer, like there's no way I know I can sit down with that football coach and be like, what do you need in this period? So for track, if I know, for example, Nisha is working on strength endurance and then her speed days are Monday, Wednesday, it's hypothetical. Like I know in the gym, Monday and Wednesday, on the track she's doing speed, Monday and Wednesday in the gym she does speed. So it matches, right? Mm-hmm. In Trinidad, like it's very, very difficult if I'm coaching an athlete to get that. Easiest was with the cyclist because they have an American coach, Erin Hartwell. So like I knew on Tuesdays they did block, they did starts, so explosive and fast. So on Tuesdays in the gym they did clean them, box squats, explosive and fast in matches. Um, but ideally that's what you want um, as a coach to be able to to um, to co- communicate with the the actual coach that you that you're working with or the actual coach of the athlete you're working with, but. You don't really get that, to be honest. I have one more question. Um, <laughs> let me get back to it. Uh, you do a lot of research. You obviously do a lot of research when it comes to the different exercises that you would do in different ways. How much research do you do? How much research do you have to carry out? Like, like say, let's say, um, like different there's different speed exercise. Like there's exercises for speed, obviously for endurance and stuff like that. And uh, there's probably some nuance. There's probably some nuances that you might be taking, that you might be find, that you might find, and then implement it into your program. Is there anything new, or maybe yeah, like anything that you might have taken recently and you might have put it into your into your program? For your yeah, I I have experimented before. Um, with the cyclists, I experimented with like cleans the box, deep or lunge, uh, for example. But at the end of the day, like. The science remains the same, and a lot of the times, simple is best, best you know. Mm-hmm. Um, all these fancy new exercises, and like I I see it, and I kind of, I would decide whether or not, you know, it makes sense, or if it's necessary. A lot of times it's not necessary, because the basic exercises are getting moved on the same way. Mm-hmm. Um, and the top athletes, when you look at, you know, the Noah Lyles, or the, the, I don't know, other sport you want to look at, Football, Cristiano Ronaldo probably not doing clean star box strong. Like he literally just doing the basics. Like at the end of the day, the science remains the same. Um, you're working the same, the same muscle fibers, and you just get it worked on. It like fancy is not. It looks cool, and I probably will get a thousand more followers. But you know, I don't think when it comes down to performance, I don't think it's necessary to to try every single new thing you see online. Yeah, so at the end of the day, just simple plyometrics. <laughs> Simple plyometrics. <laughs> okay, so what are common mistakes that you see young athletes making, and what should be advice for these upcoming athletes? Um, common mistakes. For sure, one I would say um, listening to too many people outside of your circle. Um, mm. Meaning, I've seen it, and it's becoming more and more prevalent now, um, an athlete will be with a coach or a club, but then somebody come and whisper in the ear, hey, you need to fix so and so. And then they start to lean towards that person, messaging them, hey, how you find this look? Like at the end of the day, if you're with a coach, you need to be with that coach. Um, mm. Because, you know, too much, too much, well, cooks for you brought, as you say. Too, yeah, too much hands too in many. the pot. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, I do think you need to trust a coach. Um, and there are a lot of coaches out there that are not ethical in that regard. Um, and it's about respecting that club, coach, athlete, 
um, and not overstepping, you know. Um, I understand that you may want to make someone better, but at the end of the day, there's a way to do it. Um, definitely, we'll talk to the coaches after, like, when the Williams and I have a very good relationship, he's a long-term coach. Mm-hmm. And if he's coaching his athletes sprinting, I will go to Wendell and be like, hey, he needs to cross and put on me, something like that. As opposed to just going to the side and messaging the athletes. Like, there's a way to do things that are not shady. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I would definitely tell athletes to just, you know, be cognizant of that and understand that, yeah, they may come to you on a friendly vibe, but again, it is unethical and probably shouldn't be done because they've got to go to university and do that. If, you, if your aim is NCAA, you can't be at University of Tennessee and speak it to the Auburn coach on the side. Like, right. you win the scholarship and, and Auburn Oof. will be fine for it, you know, so. Actually, very hefty. But it's understandable, but that's real hefty, though, at, at losing a scholarship because you're listening to outside voices. But that's how it goes in the game, I guess. It's a business out there. Yeah, it is. And speak about business, right? Yeah. Do you think we treat it as one in Trinidad? We treat our like, sports as a business. I know you with Memphis and you would have an idea of how the logistics would go on there. Do you think that more clubs with regards to athletes at um, track and field and like different sports should be treating sports as a business and not leisure? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I have been pushing um, for Memphis to become more, uh, I guess, value a week more. Mm. We are the only club in the country to have a, a world champion that was trained here. Um, we are the club with the most full athletic scholarships, um, starting from way back when, including me. Like, on our last call with my XF spreadsheet, we have sent over 100 athletes on scholarship. Um, and, and I've been pushing, um, the head coach definitely agrees, and the, the aim of it, what I, I said, and he, he echoes it as well, is that the amount of money an, an athlete and their parents save when they get a full scholarship that costs 50000 US a year, and they go to school for four years, and they get that for free. Um, they get gears for free, they get clothes for free, they get food for free, everything, right? And you cannot pay the coach that helping you get there $200 a month. And that is my thing. Like, every other sport... Football is 400 a month easy for three days a week. Swimming, 400 easy. And I knew it, so maybe some cheaper. But swimming could be five, six hundred dollars gymnastics, a thousand dollars for two, three days a week. And then when it comes to track, track and field especially, um, the clubs charging, like Memphis used to charge 75 dollars a month. And I mean, that's ridiculous because then 75, 75 dollars a month and people still won't pay. Um, Memphis coaches will, will get paid, right? Right. So I'm like, at the end of the day, and we have our own gym. That's what I do MP out of. Um, so they get high performance gym, they get all the equipment you need for training. And after when they turn 18 years old, because of the connects we have, they get in a scholarship. More more often than not. Um, so the argument was, and this came out as well because last year a, a lady called me, I was like, hey, I want to bring my son, what are the fees? And I said, and she's like, only. And she's like, you need to change, you need to raise your fees. So we have raised our fees. Um and I think track clubs in general have, have to do that as well. In terms of as a business, that's a national problem for sure. Um, when it, I looked at the Jamaica meet they had yesterday, and before each race, they were like men's 100 meters sponsored by Grace, Grace Foods. And then you see like all the banners. And that's just like a regular track meet, that's not even a trials or anything. Um, the amount of investment put in the sport in Jamaica. Is the reason Jamaica is where it's at now um, on the world stage. Um, and Trinidad, as bad as it is, like now Dream is with the public bank and Atlantic, I think. But let's say I don't know Dream pockets, but now Dream has a contract. Maybe now is when he don't need the help. Like when he needed the help, was when he was 19, 20, 21, 22. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of our companies jump on board after the fact. Yeah, I'm um, kind of Yeah, so given Richard Thompson a Toyota contract when he was already making money, I'm glad for Richard. Like that's how it should be. That's how NFL players, they get endorsements and stuff, but they also get endorsed before. Mm-hmm. Like you cannot jump on board when they already did all the hard work 
and grind the mother, spend money and send money for them out of however they could through Western Union and when they make it is when you want to jump on board. Like, I know they have like NIL deals now. Yeah, but look, foreigners can't get NIL. Oh. Only Americans. But yeah, so there's a real, a very reluctant mentality by corporate T in investing in sports. Um, not sure why, because they get tax breaks for it, but whatever. <laughs> Um, there's a reluctant <laughs> mentality and, you know, big up NGC, NGC actually partnered with UGT recently to try and, and get athletes to stay home mm. um, and train home. And what they are offering is like a two or three point three million dollars. Um, once once a UGT athlete decides to stay home and go UGT, um, they pay for, you know, everything. They get housing allowance, stipend, travel allowance, um, if they have a track meet away in space or wherever they want to go and NGC pays for it for them, you know. So I give kudos to NGC. I think they're really trying to to set the trend. And that's why at the Czech community, you do it at least. Well that might be it. But yeah, so um put that in the um the subtitle the I think it will pop out and make sure you put all your money together. Yeah, so Definitely, um, as a business, we're way, 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 way behind. Um, and I, I give real kudos to entries for being able to get those things with NGC Republic Bank, Puma. Mm-hmm. Um, we are the only sport that actually have a contract with two companies. And it's ever since Adidas. We had Adidas before, now it's Puma. Um, but, yeah, it's definitely, it's a mess, you know. And in terms of... Um the performance aspect of it, but you think Trinidad to be was overlooking in terms of athletic performance, not only just in track and field, but in, in sports across the board. Like, take for example, I notice that Trinidad to be with football, it is, in terms, of the, in terms of the play, they're more of a first half team more than everything, because they'll get everything done within the first half, but you see, as the game goes on, second half comes, the performance tends to slow down, and the only thing, the only reason I could think of it is that we, they're becoming too tired. And I think that ties to cardiovascular endurance and probably the nutrition that they that they eat. The, the nutrition that they get probably um, um, before they before they enter a match. So what do you think that um what do you think that's that could that could be stemming from if they not if they're not looking at it at all? Um that's a multi-layered question and there are multiple answers for that. Yeah. One, I would definitely say there's a reason individual sports in Trinidad are the most successful sports. Mm-hmm. Um, track and field, swimming, cricket to an extent, because cricket is a team sport, but it's very individualistic. Like, is you alone by the crease? Is you alone behind the stump with your people? You alone bowling? Um, there's a reason those are the more, the more successful sports. Um, and it's because individual athletes, in my opinion, cycling, individual, and we see the success they have in. Um, those athletes don't have a team to hide in, right? Yeah. So they have to work hard. They have to do what they have to do as one. Um, individual athletes are more um, inclined to do the work. I have worked with the national women's football team. I have worked with the national netball team. Um, and there's a hesitant, and it's not just the national teams, I've worked with multiple football academies. There's a hesitant attitude towards doing fitness work. Um, they want to do everything with skills, right? They want to triple the ball and they don't want to actually put the ball aside and for like 45 minutes just run. Like I don't know if there's any team I've worked with that will to literally just do proper fitness work and proper strength work. Um, and I always say you can have all these skills in the world, but when you're tired, your brain shut off and skills go down the drain, right? Um, so it's literally a, a matter of being able to, to keep that over capacity going and, and do the good. The third thing I would say is um, Trinidadians, Trinidad coaches think they can do everything. So there are certified strength coaches in Trinidad with gyms. And there is a lot of certain There are not a lot. But we have. But we have. And I'm not talking about PTI coaches who's going in the army and then come out and I guess you need to do something with them. 
Right, and I'm talking about them. I'm talking about actual strength and conditioning coaches who have, well, I don't think I have anybody in China that's this. I think it's just me and Asia. But they have like ISSC and NASM, right? And football coaches or any other sports would prefer to have the athletes on the field after doing bodyweight squats and push ups and crunches. Like, who does crunches anymore? Like, science has moved away from crunches, right? But because you are not a certified coach, you do any necessary research. You will know that, right? So I think there's a there's definitely an attitude amongst coaches that they could do everything. Um, people are not willing to invest in themselves, um, and as a result, like strength coaches are not sought after. To me, in the team sports setting, mm-hmm. for sure, in the team sports setting, um, I have worked with Alvin Jones. I've worked with like Super Warriors, but they decide to come by themselves. Like it's not a matter of them connection looking for a certified strength coach to actually do the proper work, mm. or it's not you know. So I think so much of our coaching education and knowledge in Trinidad is way behind. Um, and again, because I came from the US system, and I know Jamaican coaches, and I know how they operate. Coaching in Trinidad because it's not an industry. Coaches are not spending twenty thousand or how much have I spend right? because there's not a guarantee that they're going to make it back. So what we have are a lot of men who just like the game and they will just pull a squad and they will coach. But it's not like science-based. A lot of it is not science-based. And I'm not saying there are not coaches who not like that, who who not doing it, but the vast majority of coaches amongst all sports are not where they need to be on the world stage in terms of education. Jamaica has GC Foster, which is a university where their coaches go to, and they study for four years. Like it's not a matter of you do a, a level one course or you do a license here. Mm. Like you literally have to go to yeah, you have to go to school for four years in a university. Cuba, same thing. Um, so I think it's just a matter of of really educating our coaches and a matter of coaches being willing to be like, all right, yeah, what? This is not my field. Go by X Y Z. Get that done, and the culture has to change. Like footballers not going to start to like running and fitness until the coaches instill that in that. The, the I find the, that like from very young. I find that very ironic that footballers are the people don't like running. Up. You want? I have <laughs> dealt with. Like I literally dealt with a team once. I was screaming at them. I was like, "Time up! Get up and come, let's go!" And then I realized, I was like, "Why I my throat hurting and it's not me getting like." I already have salary done paid. It, like, no, I literally walk off the field. I was like, well, I'm already to work, you know. Um, but yeah, that, that has been my experience. Um, it's just not something that, you know, and I, I'm really trying not to. But you see it like cricket. Oh, cricket does have big bellies. Or <laughs> oh, well, men have big bellies. Like, I, it sounds bad, but that's the reality of it. Like, what do you think it does? <laughs> This is how the cricketers used to look like back in the 70s and not when he was winning championships. No, serious. They actually had a document that actually documented that. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. That's the truth. It's funny. It's funny how... It's just funny how part of being an athlete is half of it is just having the skills to do it, but you need to be fit in order to take part in the sport. You're going to be running... No, you're going to be running for the whole 90 minutes in football. But you're going to be moving. And when you're moving, you get tired. Right. But the point of that is to not be as tired as the other team is. Yeah, at least have your stamina out there. You have to yeah. do penalty kicks and stuff like that. that but the put it in the perspective, like, a track athlete will train every single day for two hours just running. And their competition is 10 seconds long. And that's Monday to Friday. Every single day for two hours, running, 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 to run a race that's 10 or 11 seconds. As opposed to a footballer who would be running for 90 minutes and want to train for an hour a week. Oh, yeah. Somebody can also, run for 90 minutes on the field. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's... Like swimming, they swim for hours in that pool and their race lasts 25 seconds. They long cut up 25 seconds. But they swim and put in that work for hours. Like, I, 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 and the lad is not in the pool practicing his flutter kicks because that's the skill of it. Like he put it in the fitness. Like a track athlete that in the blocks every single day, making sure the angle's right or making sure they drive. Like they're running laps to run 10 seconds. 
So I think if team sports and, and sports where you have to like be going back and forth, back and forth, and I tried to play tennis once, and that is real hard. It is. You can't stop stopping and have it to reaccelerate, and and that's the ball. You stop, you have to reaccelerate, you have to change direction, but you only want to dribble the ball, dribble past their partner, run around a cone, dribble past their partner. Like it's not, it's not sustainable and it's not realistic also. Right? Yeah, it's true. I had to stop doing crunches too because that's, <laughs> Please that's, don't stop doing that is old science and we knew you had to do There's updates. no sports where your core in a yeah. contracted position like this. Like every sport, you're elongated. When you're running, you're up tall, your core should be. Please stop doing No crunches. And you're talking about, um, and this will apply more to the youth aspect of it. How, do, how much do you endorse? Youth athletes play multiple sports. Not oh like, yeah, that's definitely something you do. Because you're t- while you're talking about it just now, that skills yeah. translate. So yeah. like, you can play football, basketball, tennis. You yeah, so I think skills translate the problem we have in Trinidad, I don't, like Trinidad has so many problems. Um, we don't have set seasons. So in the States, a youth athlete no between August and December is, and is American football, right? Mm-hmm. And then after that, it's shut down like this basketball season or it's track season. So athletes know and coaches know, all right, I'm not seeing X, Y, Z because they're in football, but they're coming in January. In Trinidad, an athlete will be in football factory from September to August, every single day going training. Like there's no set season to say shut off football for three months, now it's just track or basketball. Um, and that hampers mm-hmm. multiple sports because now a child who loves football they don't want to miss football for five months because they know their partner sweating mm. and they ain't track and they're asking them why they can't go football. So mm. I do think we need seasons. Um, and yeah, definitely transfer skills. So I was actually making a point of talking to some colleagues the other day and getting good now I'm cricket. Haley Matthews has three Carista medals in javelin. Yeah, Deandra Dutton, Carista medals in javelin, shot put and discuss. Um, on this last Carista team, there were three West Indies under 19s who went up in. So it's so crazy. And then for the women's World Cup, New Zealand's top fast bowler, I can't remember her name, was the World Junior Champion in Javelin. And I was telling someone, like, in the Caribbean, we don't have talent transfer. Mm-hmm. So as a football coach or a cricket coach, you must know this person, don't have a place in reach the next level to recommend them to another sport or ask them to do the boats and then eventually it will filter where you just focus on one as they get older. But um, definitely multiple sports and we try to encourage that as much as possible with Memphis. So like our kids school, we train three days a week and then we tell the parents, the other two, they need to do something else. So the other four or three, be let the rest at some point. But definitely go do something else um, and then, you know, you'll get to even the top track athletes like or NFL players, like a lot of them would have become used to play soccer Think and like basketball. The Eagles players is actually a very good track and field. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, because he played wide receiver at college and he was a good enough for USA. So, it's just a matter of, you know. But at some point, they have to specialize it. Eh? Like, it wouldn't mm-hmm. get away from that. But as a youth, they definitely, you know, should. What moment in your career would you say was your I made it moment? I ain't make it yet. <laughs> There's no for real, I'm laughing. My boss called me in a meeting and I swear I was in trouble. I drive up to Tamano, sit down in his office, and he's like, ask me to I was like, what did I do? Which app did you report me that I reported last year for being too hard? Um, from one app. But he's like, you're being too hard on yourself. You've done so much with the program, blah, blah, blah. So I think. Right now, I cannot say I've made it. I don't think I've made it. Um, like, I understand, like, people always tell me that what I've accomplished is something you've already seen in Trinidad, mm-hmm. um, especially for a female coach. But I don't, I don't think I have that moment as yet. I really want to coach an Olympian in track. But I've coached Nicholas Paul in the major room. I want to coach an Olympian, I want to coach a world champion. So I don't think I have made it 
as yet. Like, I'd rather fight them still. I think I will make it. When people stop fighting me down. When people stop fighting me down, then I will say, okay, I'll make it. Like, I'm going to put out the title. When they, when they tell them, do X in her, they do in X in her, I'm not only the athletes, I'm talking about the administration. Oh, oh, oh. When I saw them fight them, and people can be like, yo, I don't understand. So you could just say it. You could just, <laughs> you could just say, well, I need X, Y, and Z to help these athletes. And they'll just say, all right, when we can deliver, that is where you want. I don't think we never get there, but that would be the goal. But yeah, like, people just really fight me down. <laughs> and in their head, they're not fighting me down. That's a crazy thing. Like, I'd be like, you know, it doesn't make you feel you win, man. But yeah, I yeah. know you fight them at all. Like, it's crazy. But yeah, it's really a fight on still to this day. Can't fight people on the like people. Me. I can say that with a fact, like, people in the industry do not like me. And I literally, like, I knew it for a fact. And I just have to kind of like... You, you talk about working with Nicholas Paul Albert and a couple of other national cyclists as well. He recently won bronze in immense Kirin and he have another event to do this Karen. afternoon. The Kirin. Mm-hmm. I don't see Kiri on this one. The right? He used to play football at a, po- at a point in time. Yeah. Did you ever think, did you ever think that Nicholas would end up in the position that he's in? Like, going from playing football to then finding a bicycle and thinking, oh, man, I can do this too. To be competing with the likes of Jeffrey Hoogland and Harry Leverison and, and all but the I other didn't top know, cyclists. I didn't know Nicholas back then. I met him when he was already Pan Am winning champion. Okay. So that's when he came to me to work um, with the entire team. And yeah, I think it was very obvious um, that he had what it took. Um, and I, said, I went to Europe with them, so I spent some time in Germany, England, and France with them. And it was very obvious even then that he was the next, the next one to blow up. It was just a matter of him getting the support he needed um, in order to get it done. And he has gotten back in. Um, again, because now he's Nicholas Paul, so not everybody was laughing. So that's good. Um, but in terms of, yeah, so even when you look at the times Jusane was doing and Jusane was Jusane, even back when I met him in 2017, Nicholas was already close to that, and that was six years ago. Wow. He was, what, 19 or something, 18. And Jusane, even Jusane said it like when I was 21, I wasn't doing this. So being in the camp and hearing all of this, like, we knew it was going to happen. And if you know Nicholas, you'll know why it happened. He's a very hard worker. As I say, the man is by his chicken, by the gram. He knew he had to eat, I don't know, 60 grams of chicken, protein a day. Like, he's very, very, very um, committed and disciplined. Yeah, he's a, he's a, from the way them, well, he went naps. So, from the way since then, he had a very disciplined person. Like, he always knew what he was about. Did everything with purpose. And it was something I admired even back then. And as you see, he was playing football then still. So I'm really happy to see it where... Trouble, but <laughs> Nicholas was the only athlete. Every time I say, oh, I'm like, press, something more is wrong. He can't really like press. He has shin splints. And I'm like, well, he can do it. <laughs> but yeah, so he's... Don't think he... But he does his again. He should be watching. <laughs> <laughs> he probably will. He probably will, but yeah. Cycling, we have so much potential in China, like Casey Brown. He went to the Olympics soon. Um, mm-hmm. And he puts in a real cycling. It's such an expensive sport. sport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the frame for the bike alone is 40000 That's not even including the seat, the handle. They still have to buy the wheels. And then they still have to put the tires on the wheel. And the pedals. That is literally just the frame, 40000 And somebody's second hand car. You know, so it's so expensive. Um, the helmet, the shoe is 2400 euro, euros. Mm-hmm. It's ridiculous. Um, and to see the lack of corporate support, uh, well, we had two Olympians and the last Olympics, and even after what you're saying, then in 2012, um, like something had to change. And you would think that when you watch Nicholas and Paul Campbell, Reese, Campbell is the only female cyclist ever we have at, at the Olympics, like the most Olympians ever for cycling, and still don't have support. Not to mention Akil Campbell as well, too. He's a very good, he's a very good endurance cyclist, too. You would think that anytime. Are you the YouTube link for um the tracks for for those track cycling events come up? You would see everybody else have sponsorships on their um on their chest. Meanwhile, Nicholas Paul just have Trent to be go up on his chest. Um, TTOC, which is yeah, which is nice. But you could also, I mean, when you when he bow his head to Gary Therese, you think a a, a Trinidadian bike helmet 
company would have something on would have something on the on the thing. That is sponsorship, that is Google, that is global sponsorship, that is global view that you're getting from other people. So sponsor the man so we could see so sponsor the men. Sponsor like everybody. Sponsor trying our best to. Oh yeah, she really be out there doing her thing, right? That is so I personally when I saw her for the arm. The Olympics it was. Yeah, when she rode, I was so impressed. Cause I just sat down to watch it regularly now. I wasn't expecting it. And then I saw it had a children. And it's harder for her because a lot of those countries, they go with teams. Yeah. And then yes. yes. when they have a team, you can block all people. Right, right. yeah. And, and she literally breaks. didn't have a team to help on. Which I was so impressed because like, hey, you look at Trinidadian person in this. I, yeah, sat, I, was, I was up. I was up yeah. Was I was up <laughs> watching that. And I was really impressed. I was like, they really need to get more support in there for the athletes. Really do. Yeah, especially because cycling, the Olympic qualification is over three years span. Eh? Yeah. So it's not just like track and field, they go around senior champs in the Olympic Olympics. Mm-hmm. They have to like points, points. And in order to get the points of the travel, you know, like they just went to Egypt, you know, in Canada. Mm-hmm. Like where they get money from, like they, ha- they need the support. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I guess it's some curriculum. What are your thoughts on your athlete's performance at the 2023 Curriculum Games? Um, personally, we had five, um, which I think is the most from any club in Trinidad. I don't think any club had any more than five. Um, I guess going through one by one, um, Keone medal in the four by one, he ran first leg, and that was a sacrifice because he wasn't supposed to run the four by one. Um, and put in his body on the line because someone got injured, Rosal Webster got injured. So they didn't have anybody. So he ran the four by one and didn't win that. He got injured and wasn't able to run his individual hurdle. Oh. But it was what he actually qualified for. Mm. And everybody who on a national team wanted to run their individual event. So, in, I guess, being a team player, that happened. Um, but he's already silver in the four by one. I think it's silver, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I think Mahomes was disqualified or something. Um, Cyril, 4x4, four four, ran first leg, ran excellent. Um, yeah, what did it come second? Yeah, so yeah. Eight, so. Um, Stefan told me it was the biggest surprise to me, to be honest, because when he ran the heats, he ran a huge PB, and I was worried. I was like, can you repeat? And then in the finals, he ran another PB and came third. Um, his PB prior to that was 155, last stage, I mean 158. So um, the drop was gigantic, um, but again, going to training and once you know what you're programming, you kind of expected it, but you know. Haley, Haley has a long jump, um, and I was satisfied with that. You know, she's a bag of news. I honestly was expecting her to follow all the jumps, and even went to lie. I was like, oh, what a whole game. Because that Bahamas crowd is very different with that jungle or whatever they call it, jungle. Um, but she did she did well. I was very proud of her. I, I did with her in the gym and went down to her. And then the fifth person I used, she went as a reason for the four by one, so she didn't run. But she was, yeah. So, all in all, I was very pleased and um, proud of them. Um, but it, it kind of become customary for me to say, I'm not a And at the end, I didn't even like. This is just what we do. This is just what we do. This is the four by four team last year. Out of four, three of them were Memphis, and Shakim McKay okay, used to be in Memphis, and he left the world. Otherwise, I don't know. I mean, but I need You gotta get a boy to go to Memphis. <laughs> nah, point for they have to do it. And point for they have to do it. I have not. I had nothing to say on that. I have not be saying anything on that. Listen, I know some, but nobody like me because when they say they're cocky, yeah. But I don't even know you. Yeah, I call that confidence. I know which action. I mean, you're standing on your results. Is on your results. You're standing. Now, but to be honest, I will say like um uh what's the word I'm looking for like. Trinidad's performance as a whole, um, it's very disappointing to be that behind Bahamas with only 300,000 population. Um, they got like 40 something, they got 21. And I think the entire system has to change. I think we need to go to a school based system. This club thing not working anymore. Mm. Um, mm. What would the school based system mean? To, uh, like? It's like Jamaica and like Bahamas Jamaica, and the, yeah. US, the US is also high school based. Um, we do clubs, so like 0.4 to New Jersey, Memphis, Finance, yeah. etc. 
but you lose so much talent that way. There's a huge leak because, for example, Memphis trains right now in the Savannah. But if there's a child in Success Laventive who may not have money to travel to train, so now, hi, I want to join Memphis where you train in Savannah. Okay, and then they just will come because some people don't have the money from yeah. Success Laventive to go in the top, from Tom to Savannah, that's two cars, and then you another two to go. Yeah. So they just don't come. Yeah. Whereas in the school system, if there's a backyard or a field, can, the, the school them. trains there. Yeah. So literally from your class, you go to train. And it's easier to pour the resources into schools to build programs than yeah. to actually start building a whole different set of clubs all right. over. Yeah. So, so like how the NCAA, something like the something like NCAA. But NCAA is a whole machine by itself, right? I don't know, yeah. like high school. It's separate. Okay. Right. Yeah, high school needs to be, um, needs to be a, a school system. Um, and then the talent pool is bigger. So a school has, what, 500 students? So you can literally pick as opposed to a club that only have 20 people. Mm -hmm. Because now, as I say, the boy that could run, just staying in school, not difficult. And then he wanted to travel to train it because they didn't want a lot of money to give him for that transport and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So we just lose too much talent. Yeah, that's really the case. Real sport people that get draft from sports, they are thinking. Yeah. yeah, that's how it works, you know. That's how it works in Bahamas. That's so how it works. See me run. Nah. And I, get, and I get pick up for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and I get that definitely. Yeah. Can you still put my line for to know sports? Like, we also need better coaches. Um, I don't think, and I just, I have a lot, a lot to learn. I have a lot to learn. Um, but it's also one thing to have a school system. But mm -hmm. then, you know, the same coaches that are not doing what they need to do in the clubs or who coach in the schools. That's you true. understand? So yeah, that's it's true. just a matter of coaching education and making sure we have coaches that are educated and keeping up with the science and you know, doing it. Mm. Okay. So as we wrap up, we talk about how you can connect with you by social media, with your business. Mm. <laughs> um, okay, so first of all, I'm recruiting for UTT, track mm -hmm. team. To get. No, seriously, for UTT, definitely those who are not able to get a scholarship right now, you need to know the NCAA rules. If you're out of high school or was it in a month of time, you cannot get a scholarship. So, therefore, come UTT. Mm -hmm. Use UTT as a gateway to get to the US. You shouldn't put that in the thing. <laughs> right. Um, that description can be real long. <laughs> um, my Instagram is Coach B. Is it Coach B? Why did you trick me into thinking that he was good? But he is good. What happened last season? <sighs> the coaching scheme. Yeah, he didn't no. have a good coach. Yeah, he sucks, he sucks, he sucks. And he had one of he's like 34 or something. And he's got Sierra's. At least. How about your Eagles though? How you felt about the last season and going into the season? Like, how, how confident do you feel to go back to the city? Um, we were not going to go to Sean. For sure. Mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, you had a good season, your producer wanted to wrap up, so I want to... Oh yeah, yeah, and you're hungry too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's it. Okay, I swear your pistons too, but they stink. No, let's not talk about pistons. <laughs> Alright, so <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah. Uh, make sure to follow to transport on all the social media. Have merch. Hopefully I got a hat. <laughs> really? Ah, you're not the best boss ever. <laughs> after my boss, after my boss. When you're ready. When you're ready. Alright, what else? Snap that. Yeah, we have here. Yeah, for the photo of one thing. Uh, Coach, thank you for joining us. I think we had this, we had this going on for a week. 
you had this thing planned out for a week to, to get you out of your busy schedule, your tiring schedule. Facts. Just to get you out and just talk for us for, for an hour. I was very grateful. Very a lot of a lot of nice insights in the coaching in the coaching. Yeah, yeah, I learned a lot today. Yeah, I and, did. You know, and all the athletes, I'm sure they got they appreciate the work that you've been helping them with and whatnot. So again, um, on behalf of everybody here. Um, thank you for joining us and the chat today. Thanks for having me. Yes. So, thank you all listeners for joining us today. Be sure to follow Total Sports on all social media platforms and be sure to follow Antonia on her social media platforms. Until next time, bye. Bye, the merch. Bye, merch. <laughs> Get out of bye, merch. Coaching. How much do you have? <laughs> <laughs> How much? 150. 150. Oh, you're going